Good morning, everyone. We have now reached the month of July, once again. And this month, we're talking about freedom of thought and expression. And I'm kind of orienting that toward creativity this month, too. Um, and my, my uh, title today is, I dare you to prove you aren't creative. So, how many of you have been told at some time in your life by someone, and listen to the list, you can raise your hand as appropriate, um, you're clumsy, you don't remember things, you can't sing, you should just hum along, you can't dance, um, your drawing is atrocious, and anybody ever hear any of those things? If you heard anything like that, raise your hand. Okay, now leave your hand up for a second. Look around. And so many of us think that means that we're not creative when we can't do one or more or all of those things to the degree that it becomes recognized and welcomed and wanted. Um, and so we, we get this false idea that we are not really creative ourselves. Um, you know, you could be an accountant, you might be an insurance salesman or a real estate person, you might work in retail, you might be an office person, you might manage a company and think that you're not creative. But we're innately creative from the time we're little kids. Uh, this story illustrates creative thinking. This, this uh, gal has her two little boys at home, and um, one of them is in the third grade, and he has just gotten his report card, which is kind of so-so. I mean, he really doesn't apply himself. He does fine without applying himself. And so he announced one night over dinner that his friend Robert was the smartest kid in the third grade class. And the mother was hoping that she could create some motivation in her son, you know, by using that as an example. So she said, well, what would you have to do to be the smartest one in the class? And he really pondered that for a minute, and then he said, get rid of Martin? <laughs> this is a creative solution to the problem. Um, that is not what his mother was expecting him to say. We, um, if you have learned to speak, you're creative. If you have learned to ride a bike or cook or solve a problem in mathematics or write or type or learn to use a computer or drive a car, you are creative. And so I want to give you some, some definitions of what it means to be creative. These are my definitions. Webster probably wouldn't go along with these necessarily, but these are my definitions. So first, I am daring you. And a dare, when somebody dares you, it is a challenge to respond. You know, you can, you can sneak out of it, but the intention is to push you to respond. Now, when I say I dare you to prove, so what is proof? What is actually proof? Well, proof is meaningful evidence. So it's not that everybody's told you that all your life. It's actually meaningful evidence that is um, repeated, that can be repeated. That's proof. And creativity, I would say in a broad sense, really is applying a hunch to solve a problem. So, if you can do that in any circumstance, if you have had to come up with a new idea for how to um, encourage your child to do something or not do something, if you have made up a recipe, or if you have learned how to speak another language or play an instrument or ride a bike or pitch a softball or drive a car or pretty much anything, you learn to walk. You know, I think everybody in here at one point or another learned to walk. You have to be creative to do any of those things. What do you do? You watch 
what someone else is doing, and then you do that. And if you can do that, you're creative. If you can't do that, then you're not creative. But there's, you know, short of being catatonic, probably, pretty much everybody can do some of that, no matter what else is going on with them. And so, when we think about people being creative, so this little person is filled with creativity. It's coming from every direction. It's pouring out in every direction. And it is creating patterns in the life around this person. Inventors, artists, scientists, sports heroes and heroines, um, uh, business greats, um, thinkers of all sorts, people in every field have to solve problems creatively, together or individually. They have to be able to solve the problems of getting along with other people, the problems of the work environment and space, the other people that they work with, because even if we're not with anyone else, even if we're all by ourselves, we still have the challenge of dealing with us. And sometimes I find I have to be creative in dealing with me. I have to sometimes find a way to think about something to trick myself into where I want to be in consciousness. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, and this is dumb, but it worked. Um, I used to hate to make the bed. And so I thought, you know, I could make this an enjoyable experience that I would look forward to rather than resenting and avoiding by doing something that I find fun at the same time. So I turned on the television. Now that seems stupid, but it completely transformed my willingness to go and make the bed. That was interesting to me. I also sometimes, when I'm very stuck about a Sunday morning talk, will imagine that it's Sunday afternoon and the talk went great and I feel fabulous and I hang with that until I can really kind of get that bubbling inside of me and then I go work on the talk and it does make a difference. You know, there has been evidence now um, and it's accumulating gradually, um, evidence that's done with all kinds of better and better studies that when we observe something, we have an effect on it. That when we observe something, it does something that might be different than what it would be doing if we weren't observing it or if we weren't measuring it. And this happens, you know, in physics with atoms and molecules and little stuff, right? And yet, you might remember that I said a few weeks ago I was at a, a Silomar conference once when we did a, an energy experience of giving negative energy to somebody that was on stage and then giving positive energy to that same person and noticing the difference in the energy field that could be um, detected around them. So I was really frustrated yesterday because Amanda was watching uh, the Wimbledon finals that she had um, uh, access to, you know, taped. And I was listening to the commentators um, who, although they really don't know what's going to happen, will speak as if they do and talk constantly about how someone is doing. Now, think of that. So, while this athlete is doing what they're doing, and if they're having a challenge, and somebody's expounding on that, and expecting it and seeing it every time they do the next thing, and it's a broadcast that millions of people are watching, don't you think that has an effect on the athlete? I do. And the same thing, I think, happens with elections, because we're doing election returns and projections from the time they start voting on the East Coast. And don't you think that all of those predictions and all that information and all those percentages that go on and on and on for hours affect how it comes out and how the rest of the people across the country vote or don't? Of course it does. We're watching that together with millions of people. We're creating a unified consciousness. So, when you want to change a unified consciousness, it's not an easy thing to do. 
In the 1950s, Roger Bannister did something that up until that point had been thought impossible. He was a runner who was the first one to break the four-minute mile. And initially, he, he broke it by some, some short amount of time. But one of the things I have heard, and whether this is true or not, I don't know, about him is that before that, before he started to, to work to try and do that, one of the things that occurred to him was that he really couldn't tell the difference physically between four minutes and a tenth of a second faster. So if that was true, why shouldn't he be able to go a tenth of a second faster? After he broke the four-minute mile, the next, in the next six months, somebody else broke the four-minute mile. Later on, not that much later on, three guys broke it the same year, maybe even in the same track meet, I can't remember. And now high school students are breaking the four-minute mile. It was impossible until it wasn't. And it's an amazing thing to discover what is possible when we change our thinking about what we thought was impossible. You know, in Illusions, the book by Richard Bach, the uh, mentor says to the mentee, you know, you think by saying impossible a lot of times, hard things are going to get easier for you? Nikola Tesla, who was an amazing inventor and visionary and mystic, really, said, my brain is only a receiver in the universe. There is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know that it exists. Wow. One of the um, pioneering, I guess, psychotherapists in hypnosis, in the therapeutic use of hypnosis, um, he was giving a lecture demonstration to an audience full of medical students. So, you know, they already have been told they're the cream of the crop a lot of times before they get to your lecture. So, you know, it's probably a little more like, okay, what do you know? So he asked for a volunteer to join him on the platform. Now, remember, he was talking about um, therapy as a, hip as a hypnotist. I imagine there was some skepticism in the room. So I had a volunteer join him on the platform. A young man came forward and took a seat facing the audience and then placed his hands on his knees, which is what Erickson directed him to do. And then Erickson asked him, would you be willing to continue to see your hands on your knees? And the student said he would. And while he was talking with him, um, Erickson silently gestured to a colleague who walked up on the other side of the young man and raised his right arm into the air and the arm stayed there. Then Erickson said to the young man, how many hands do you have? Two, of course, the young man answered. I'd like you to count them as I point to them, said Erickson. All right, said the young man in a patronizing tone. So Erickson pointed to the hand resting on the left knee, and the young man counted one. He pointed to the right knee, where there was no hand, and the young man said two. And he then pointed out the hand dangling in midair, and the student became hopelessly confused. Well, how do you explain that other hand? asked Erickson. I don't know, said the young man. I guess I should be in the circus. <laughs> now, you may have guessed by now that the volunteer was already hypnotized. The astonishing part of the story is that he was not hypnotized before he came up on the stage. Erickson was such a master of the art that when he said, would you be willing to continue seeing your hands on your knees? That was it. There was something in the way he said it, in the tone, in the look, that allowed that young man to move into the subjective state of consciousness, the responsive, receptive state of consciousness that can receive suggestion and that is always active in us. But when you're trying to move upstream with something like Roger Bannister was, you have to really get very strong in your own thinking to move upstream against this vast pool of subconscious belief that people have.
Father Sean O'Leary, this rebel priest I know in the South Bay, he told a story once about uh, these school kids that they didn't experiment with. And they wanted to teach them something scientific. So they brought these little kids in. These are like, you know, uh, grammar school kids. And they had a beaker of water on the, on the desk in the front of the kids um, with a stick in it, a big stick in it. And the stick, they, so they asked the children, you know, so what do you see? And they said, well, we see a bent stick in the water. The stick is bent. And so the teacher pulled the stick out, and it was a straight stick. So they could explain to the kids this scientific principle about, I guess, the refraction of water. And so the kids thought that was amazing, and they, that was great. Then the stick back in the water, or, or yeah, there was a stick in the water for the next group of kids who were older. And these kids were probably, uh, you know, middle school somewhere. And so they said to those kids, what do you see? And they said, well, we see a stick in the water that looks like it's bent, but it's actually straight. It just looks like it's bent because this is what the water does. And the teacher pulled out the stick, and it was a bent stick. And the lesson there was not about the refraction of water because the kids knew that lesson already. This was about jumping to conclusions because of past experience. Having something in mind that you already believe is true and therefore not actually making space for other possibilities. And we do that all the time. And it helps us to survive and cope with the world, but it also sometimes gets in our way. And I, I remember giving a talk a lot of years ago about creativity and how everyone is creative in their own ways and that the things that we go about every day in the world we often don't think of as creative, but if you've ever driven a different route to work, you did something differently. You applied something different to what you usually do. So when we want to grow and stretch and change, the first thing that we need to do if we're stuck is do something differently. Almost anything, you know, to brush your teeth differently, put on your shoes differently, um, just change it up because when we begin to shake up that familiar we make space for other things to show up that's been my experience so I gave this talk about creativity how we're all creative and there's space for us to express and this woman came up to me during the week and met me in my office and gave me all these songs that she had written that really weren't very good and she wanted us to use them on Sundays with the congregation and some other church, some other little church had really liked these and had used them. Um, and I told her, I'm going to give these to our music director and let him decide because it's, re it's his responsibility to, to look at the music and decide what, what is right for our group. And so we'll let you know. And he looked at them and listened to them and said, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't use these here, you know. So I let her know that uh, it wasn't going to work for us there. And she was very upset because I had said everybody was creative and should have their place to express. I said, yes, but not every place is the right place for everybody to express. You know, it has to fit the place. I'm saying there is a place, not that because you want it to be this place that it is this place. Are you with me here so far? So what, what the danger in that is that she stops doing what she's doing. Uh, or she gets so resentful that she can't move past that into her, deeper into her creativity, which is trying to grow and be expressed and has even been appreciated in a particular venue. So, you know, we were just talking this morning in the car on the way down here about um, the, the thing that uh, Julia Cameron said about George Lucas. You know, have you thought about accounting, George? Because, and the way that came about is, she was teaching a, um, a beginning film class to students and she asked a bunch of directors to send their early student films because she said too often our students are comparing their work to somebody that won an Academy Award, you know? And so what we want to see is the development. And she said the only director who would do it was George Lucas. No one else would send her their early work. So she showed it to her students and she said, you know, if you're watching it with the tenderest of eyes, you might imagine somewhere in there the possibility of Star Wars. But actually, the first reaction was more like, have you thought about accounting, George? 
So you see, the thing can happen where we cut ourselves off from our creativity because of a message that we've received somewhere, and instead of seeing it as a stoplight, what we really need to be able to recognize is that's just a yellow light letting us know to slow down and look around and do the next step that's necessary. Sometimes there's other parts to our creativity that need to come forward. And one of the, one of the challenges that we have in this development of the expression of all that we are is that we believe myths about creativity that aren't really true. So there are five of them. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into them in detail. I'm just going to mention them to you. The first myth is that creative people are right-brained. So therefore, if you're logical or analytical, you could never be creative. That's not true. They measure creativity lighting up all over the brain, and sometimes various parts of the brain are cooperating together when periods of creativity are happening. So that's not a good excuse. Creative people pull their inspiration out of thin air. You know, it sometimes seems like, geez, they're just brilliant. You know, they, they have a dream, they wake up, they know the answer. But what they actually do is something we all do from time to time, and it's called divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is that kind of just relaxed, aimless kind of thinking when we take a break from focusing on a particular problem, when we let it go and let our minds wander. So that's not a good excuse. Creative people specialize in the arts. I've already addressed that. Yes, creative people do specialize in the arts, but that's not all. Computer people are creative. Mathematicians are creative. Plumbers are creative. You know, we can't help it. Creative people are simply born with it. Some people have the gift. Some people just don't have the gift. No, if they're here, they're creative. So, we sometimes look at people who have won an Academy Award, like George Lucas, or somebody who has broken um, a record, like Roger Bannister, and we think, well, they were simply born with that. They just simply had that in them. Maybe, but we forget about the hours and years of practice and study and application that people do in the process of mastery. Yes, there may be some rare few who just have something and they don't have to do any of that. But that's not creative people in general. That's this tiny little subset of creative people. So we can't use that as an excuse. Creative people are loners. And I'm an extrovert, so therefore I'm not a creative person. Or creative people are all crazy. And I'm sane, so therefore I can't be creative. Or um, creative people are all uh, mentally ill. Or, I, you know, I don't know, whatever it might be. But none of those things are, are accurate. We find creative people in every walk of life, in every form of personality. And so we can't use that as an excuse not to recognize that we're creative too. I think sometimes when we get negative feedback, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? So we stop instead of recognizing, oh, maybe this is a course correction that I'm on here. Albert Einstein said we have to learn to think in a new way. Learn to think in a new way. And uh, Schubert, Franz Schubert, told a friend that his own creative process consisted in remembering a melody that no one had ever heard or thought of before. Remembering a melody. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes I think we believe, or I, or I should speak for myself, I have believed that if I were to imitate somebody else or copy somebody else, that that would really be cheating. That wouldn't be creative. But what I've discovered about myself is that as I see how somebody else did something, as I get it how to do it, or I learn how to do it their way, then I start to get ideas. I might not be able to originate that, but I can build on it and originate new things from there. So that's a creativity too. So I sometimes tell ministerial students, you know, if you want to imitate somebody, if you're going to take a quote or a story or something like that from somebody else, steal for the best. Look for them and go, you know, it's a compliment. And oftentimes we'll say, you know, I learned this from Reverend so-and-so or I heard this joke from Reverend so-and-so. Um, steal from the best. Learn and build on. Learn and practice and build on. Um, 
copy, and then perfect and diverge from there. That's what we want to be able to do. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, put it this way, and I think this is really um, comforting. He says, when anyone conceives a new idea, thinks up a new plan for procedure, which is in accord with the divine nature, then God is going forth anew into creation through that individual. And that person may and should expect that all the power and all the presence there is will creatively flow through their individual word, word because they have complied with the fundamental law of harmony governing all life. So when we get in alignment with that flow and we let it through, what we bring forth is better than we could have imagined we could have done ourselves. Does this make sense? Really? Okay. So what I'm saying is that that energy, that flow of intelligence and creativity that comes through, it isn't just ours. We don't just own it. We make a space for it to come through so that we don't have to feel 100% responsible to make it perfect because that wasn't why it was coming through us in the first place. It came through us because the vehicle that we were was the exactly right one for what needed to come through in that moment. And so if we open up as much as we can, let it through as full as we can, even own our own discomfort or embarrassment with it, if necessary, but let it through, then it can go out and do what it was meant to do. And what it does out there is really none of our business. Because ours was to let it through. The receptors out there, that's something else. And we receive in that process as well. I want to share a, a brief uh, idea with you. Uh, this is a picture uh, from the movie The Biggest Little Farm. This couple in Southern California, um, he was a, a photographer and a documentary filmmaker. She was a foodie. Uh, they adopted a dog. And the dog barked so much they got evicted from their apartment in Southern California. And they had decided they wanted a farm. So they bought this piece of land in Ventura County that is absolutely dead. It has been mono-cropped uh, and the soil is completely depleted. It's hard as a rock. It's in the middle of a drought and they have acres of this. And they want to create a farm and they have no clue how to do it or what they're doing. And so they hire a, like a farm um, guru and he has a vision for a completely eco-friendly, interactive system of plants and animals. And so they begin, and they, I want to actually look at the info for this because it's so amazing how it turned out for them in the long run. What? Okay. Um, they, they get about uh, family and friends to, to invest with them, and they have to deal with collapsed structures and all this land. Then they have to learn about worms and manure and snakes, and they have to deal with snails and gophers and coyotes and drought and rain and fire, all of that, and life and death, all of that. And it is... There are times when it looks like they're going to lose everything. There are times when it's so difficult, you can't imagine anybody persisting. And they have a handful of people helping them who are very devoted. And this visionary who's helping to guide the process. And that, I was looking for a before picture to put up with this, but I couldn't find it. This is what this place looks like now. And um, it's uh, Apricot Lane Farms. It's in Ventura County. It's, well, they've done amazing things, but you want to see the movie to watch the entire unfoldment of this thing. From these two people who have an idea and have absolutely no business doing this to 10 years later and all of the stuff that happens in between. That is crickets, crickets, I hear crickets. Yeah, that was, you know, that was good timing actually, yeah. <laughs> That was really good timing. So 
in order to enhance our happiness and creativity, I want to give you a few little tips about reconsidering your conclusions if you have secretly thought, or even if you knew you weren't supposed to think it, that you weren't creative. Here are a few suggestions for enhancing your personal creativity and happiness. This comes from uh, Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly, his book on creativity, flow, and the psychology of discovery and invention. Here are a few suggestions for enhancing your personal creativity and happiness. You ready? Try to be surprised by something every day. Try to surprise at least one person every day. And write down each day what surprised you and how you surprised others. Find out what you like and what you hate about life and start doing more of what you like and less of what you hate. Look at problems from as many viewpoints as possible. Produce as many ideas as possible. And try to produce unlikely ideas. Part of what makes us brilliant as human beings is that we can look at something and see humor in it or see the sacred in it or see ourselves in it. And we can create a thought, a belief, an idea, a result out of that. It is imagination that allows us to go there. So let your creative imagination loose this week. Pick, pick one of those things to find everything, every day, something to be surprised about or to try to think up as many unlikely ideas as possible. Try one of those this week and brush your teeth a little differently. And pretty soon you'll start to recognize all the ways in which the truth is you can't prove you're not creative because you are creative. That's how you were made. Namaste. Mm -hmm.